When you first begin your journey in Grim Dawn, you awaken inside the Devil's Crossing after almost being hung by Jarvis. While Devil's Crossing acts as the initial hub where you'll find all of your services and quests you'll need to start out, there also is an interesting backstory to the area that tells us more about how the Ethereals went about their assault on Karen. Before the Grim Dawn, the Devil's Crossing was known as the Burwitch Prison that originally housed some of the worst criminals in the world, such as Darius Cronley. All throughout Act 1, you can find criminal records notes that show us exactly what kind of prisoners were kept in the Devil's Crossing. Leander Blackwater Green Ex-military man wanted for extortion and murder. Leander was dishonorably discharged from the Demolitions Division following a grisly civilian incident. Leander escaped custody on at least two separate occasions using unsanctioned explosive devices. News of sightings or proof of death should be brought before Warden Krieg of Burwich Prison. A reward of 1,000 royal crowns is offered for the successful capture and delivery of Leander Green alive. Bloody Jack, reckless murderer and known worshipper of Zalael, the heathen god. Reports have been received of Blake Jack's signature murders, a carved throat and witch symbols etched into the left breast, appearing increasingly close to Burwich. Citizens are advised to avoid traveling alone and to steer clear of the forest roads whenever possible. News of sightings or proof of death should be brought before Warden Craig of Burwich Prison. A reward of 400 royal crowns is offered for the successful capture and delivery of Bloody Jack alive. Everett the Bloodbound a heathen and a blood drinker, known associate of Chthonian cults, and supplier for the heretics. When confronted by the law, Everett unleashed a fury of arcane atrocities upon the enforcers and escaped. Extremely dangerous individual, personnel not trained to deal with the heathen arts are advised to steer clear. News of sightings or proof of death should be brought before Warden Craig of Burwich Prison. A reward of 1200 royal crowns is offered for the successful capture and delivery of Everett to Bloodbound alive. The prison was headed by Warden Krieg himself. He was always known for his ruthlessness, but has become increasingly cruel leading to the events of the Grim Dawn. Searching through the rubble of the prison, you will find the crudely scrawled note that gives us insight on what was going on in this prison just before the apocalypse. Now, I ain't a decent man and I sure ain't good at writing, but word needs to get out about what this place really is. This prison, it ain't like no joint I have ever been in, and I've seen double my share. Men don't stay here long neither, and some of the lads they haul in, they ain't criminals. I'd know, the moment I see a man I can tell by his eyes that he done wrong. These boys, I see fear. I seen this warden a couple of times, big man in black armor. If you ain't no better. You'd think that he was one of the wrong side of the bars. Every day, he and his lackeys take prisoners out to his hut by the yard in the dozen. They ain't never come out. Later, a wagon rolls in by the hut. It always leaves full. They don't let us out of our cells anymore, but I can tell there ain't much of us left. The halls are quiet. I'm the last man in my row. The others? They was taken in yesterday's batch. I ain't asking for pity. I know my end's in that hut. But perhaps this note will be my one good deed in my pathetic life. So we learned that the prison started taking in people that seemed to be innocent, and that Warden Krieg would regularly take prisoners out to a hut to seemingly kill them and transport their bodies into a wagon. This was obviously no ordinary prison. Looking at the Harbormaster's log found in the abandoned waterfront can give us another perspective on the transportation of these prisoners. Another boat arrived filled with hooded prisoners, dozens of them. As usual, a wagon was waiting for them, but from what I hear, it doesn't take them far. One of the loading boys came back from Burwich after visiting that their new doctor, and he said the wagon stopped outside the warden's mansion. The lad asked about the prisoners, and one of the handlers said rehabilitation. Not sure what to make of that. There's been over a dozen of these prisoners transports in as many weeks. I just don't see how they can fit them all in that mansion. I don't care how big that place may be, Krieg won't be keeping a prison's worth of no good thieves under his roof. Something peculiar is going on and it don't settle right with me and my stomach. Might have to send word up the lake to Malmouth, get one of them inquisitors down here to look into this curiosity. Can't say I want one of them inquisitors poking around here much either though, they make a man uneasy. 
The Harbor Master did end up calling an Inquisitor over to investigate, and that Inquisitor is none other than Inquisitor Creed, at which we can find his journal entries all throughout Act 1. I am currently en route to the village of Burwich in order to investigate a number of strange incidents that have been reported in this area. As dusk is drawing near and the swamps of this region are said to be hazardous to travel at night, I've reluctantly taken up lodging at a small squalid tavern in the lower crossing. Perhaps I am wary from my hurried travels, but I fear that there is a strange pressure and electricity in the air. It is almost akin to the still before a thunderous summer gale, but yet the sun shines and not a cloud is to be seen. Everything seems as it should, but in my gut I feel that something terrible will soon come to pass. As I was packing to resume my journey to Burwich, my assistant was urgently requested at a logging camp in the old grove west of Devil's Crossing, where strange animal attacks have left three lumbermen listless and pale. Upon arriving, I received a somber greeting from the foreman, who informed me that the bitten workers have gone mad and fled the premises. They were reported to have spoken in an unknown tongue. The foreman showed me the remains of the animals, two grey foxes and the hound, suffering from some sort of horrific mange, lay in a hastily dug pit behind the outhouse. The foreman told me that the animals suddenly died when confronted by the workers and a strange green vapor emanated from their remains. Shortly afterward, the three lumbermen fell ill and their mental state rapidly deteriorated. It appears that my presence in this region is most warranted. I finally arrived in Burwich after passing through the dismal area known as Whitemire. For years, tales of supernatural occurrences have circulated about Whitemire, and indeed the name itself makes one uneasy. I hadn't put much stock in them, but my recent experiences lend some credence to the old tales. Nevertheless, I have reached my destination, and it seems that the Warden of Devil's Crossing, who resides in Burwich, somehow anticipated my arrival. A footman greeted me as soon as I entered town, and insisted I accept Craig's invitation to be put up at his manor. I find this very peculiar, but I have accepted the offer as it may be my best chance to investigate the manor itself. I'm going to make this entry short, as I've just been summoned to join Craig for supper in the dining hall. This should prove illuminating. I've been a guest to Warden Krieg at his manor for over a week now and my suspicions that something terrible is going on here grow with each day. Every day I set out to some destination in or around Burwich to investigate yet another unusual crime or ominous rumor. Some are easily dismissed as more mundane human crimes or merely fantastic tales, but many of my investigations have come to darker conclusion. I feel there is a pattern emerging here, but I cannot yet put the pieces together. These are peripheral cases though, and the main purpose of my involvement in them is to give pretense for my prolonged stay in Burwich. Craig himself has become the focus of my primary investigation. Despite an overwhelming conviction that Craig is not what he appears to be, and is almost certainly involved in some sort of unnatural activity, I have found no irrefutable evidence of wrongdoing that could be used to open an official inquiry. Much of the manor itself is closed off to me. There are rooms upstairs from which Craig and other visitors come and go, but I am not permitted to enter. Stranger yet, I've awoken in the night to sounds like the creaking of wagons moving along a road, but then looked out my window down upon the village and seen nothing. Where are these sounds coming from? The game of cat and mouse continues, but as of yet, I am not certain who is the cat and who is the mouse. After the events of the Grim Dawn, the Devil's Crossing was inhabited by Darius Cronley and many other ex-convicts as a safe haven. A man named John Bourbon happened by it with a group of refugees and drove the ex-convicts out to turn their safe haven into a makeshift refugee camp. After you help out John Bourbon with a few favors, he gives you some information that he has learned from searching through the prison's logs. Good work. While you were gone, I dug through some of the files in this office, and I think we have our target. As you are acutely aware, ethereals can possess humans and bend them to their will. I always had my suspicions, but now I have little doubt. The former warden of this prison is possessed. Well before the grim dawn, in fact. There have been countless holes in the prison records, prisoners just disappearing, never to be seen again. The warden's personal logs paint a more complete picture. He's been transferring prisoners into a secret facility underneath his mansion in Burwich Village for years. 
What for? I don't know, but I'm sure it wasn't for rehabilitation. There are also several mentions of ethereals and rift gates. I need you to find this man, or whatever he has become. Warden Krieg owned a mansion in the northern district of Burwich Village. The logs indicate that his facilities can be reached via the cellar. I'm afraid I don't have more to go on, but if we want to strike back at the ethereal power structure in the region, the Warden is our... It seems that Warden Creek has had contact with the Ethereals for years before the Grim Dawn, and it's most likely that he's possessed by one of the Ethereals himself, so you are tasked with finding and putting an end to his life. Once you reach his mansion to the far north of Burwich, you find an excerpt from the Warden Creek's journal. I have taken possession of my assigned vessel, the local prison warden. I appeared to him in his bedchamber and proposed to join him. I had anticipated fear and skepticism, but these humans are apparently all too ready to enter any pact they believe will profit them. Krieg is not a particularly strong-willed human, but he is persistent and constantly scratches at my consciousness. I have him under control, though. Krieg's position as an incarcerator of other humans will greatly facilitate our efforts. His expansive dwelling is a massive cellar that I believe we can use to fashion an underground transit to conceal our activities and the transportation of bodies. There is much work ahead to prepare for our glorious dawn, but I rather enjoy this physical body. It has many advantages. This journal entry confirms the suspicion that Krieg has been possessed by an ethereal for years, and it seems to have been written by the ethereal possessing him himself. Krieg's underground cellar has been repurposed to a laboratory where the ethereals can test on humans and prepare an army of the living dead before rising up for their glorious dawn. Throughout the underground laboratory, you can find three different notes from a man named Gethrand. It is unclear why the ethereals are so interested in tissue preservation. One of my colleagues has posited that they may intend to use human corpses as vessels for possession when they bring more of their kind into our realm. Wagon loads of corpses continue to stream in day and night. The sheer quantity is staggering, and I begin to suspect that they are not merely executed criminals as we've been told. Gethrand wasn't possessed by an ethereal, but was helping them out of his own free will. It seems like they needed a free-willed human with knowledge of human anatomy in order to help experiment, as possessing him would likely dissipate his memories. We entered stage 2 of our trials today, but the results were not what I had anticipated. We've progressed to the point where the corpses can endure for months, possibly years, with a minimal, mostly external, deterioration. Our ethereal overseer seemed satisfied, and he, or it, unexpectedly placed his hand upon one of the corpses and released a spark of ethereal energy. The thing began to move as if it were alive again. It was a ghastly sight. What I found far more troubling, though, is that these corpses are clearly not meant to serve as ethereal hosts. It has become known to me that they prefer living hosts. The sheer number of corpses they're hauling over through here suggests a far worse realization. An army. It seems like Gethrand is starting to understand just what the Ethereals have planned with these dead bodies, and he doesn't seem to like it. This will be my last entry as I have determined to end my life. I cannot bring myself to carry out these abominable experiments any longer. I may have already doomed humanity with my actions. Though I felt long shunned by my fellows at the academy, and th thought that the ethereals could offer me something greater, I can no longer be a part of this. I fear that if they find my body, they will use me for their experiments. So I must be discreet, returning as one of those things would be unbearable. Here we learn why Gethrin was helping the ethereals. He felt shunned by his academy he was at, and has been manipulated by the ethereals into thinking that he can use his knowledge for the greater good. He mentions that he doesn't want to turn into one of those, but it seems like his plan failed since we are able to find him in-game as an ethereal abomination going by the name of Gethrin the Betrayed. Searching further through the underground laboratory, you'll find a note from the Gethrin's colleague, Zanbrandt. My colleague Gethrin took his life today. That short-sighted fool. He could never see the big picture. And this project was no different. Gethrin could not fathom the glorious vision of the Ethereals and the role we will play as the early human collaborators. This isn't about personal gain. We will elevate humanity. Certainly, there has been a cost in lives, but progress always has a price. So what if the dirty mash issue will perish in the glorious dawn when the Ethereals reveal themselves to the world? 
To the ethereals, we were like some base primitive creature as this lith are to us. Those of us who will serve, or better yet, bond with an ethereal shall forge a new human future. He seems to be much happier with his relationship with the ethereals, and we can find him in-game as Zanbrand the Ascended. You'll also be able to find the next two entries of Inquisitor Creed's journal down in this underground prison. Creek has gotten the better of me, and I'm presently at his mercy, imprisoned beneath his manor. Seeing no other way to progress in my investigation, I forced my way into the locked portions of the manor and found myself in a veritable house of horrors. The unusual sorcery of the locks should have been my first clue that I was dealing with something much more extraordinary than some rogue occultist. My search led me through the room filled with the rotting bodies of men and women subjected to brutal torture and horrible experimentation, or perhaps a mix of the two. Behind the manor, I found a door leading down into the earth beneath the estate, where I found myself quickly lost in an implausibly large dungeon. I wasn't long before I sensed things moving in the darkness all around me, and they quickly closed in, surrounding me. As I prepared to fight for all I was worth, Creek's massive form emerged from the shadows, his face expressionless. He spoke coolly, as though nothing at all was out of the ordinary, and invited me to tour his facility. While I had no doubt that something unpleasant was planned for me, it at least delayed my concentration with the living horrors gathering in the dark. I've lingered in this dank cellar for one long unsettling day in the night of terrors. Krieg allowed me to witness the process by which they are preserving human bodies for what he calls the glorious dawn. I've gotten glimmerings of another consciousness within Krieg which is joined with or possibly in control of him. From the way he spoke, it is clear that this is only some small part of a much greater conspiracy that I suspect many other persons in key positions have been possessed by things akin to which now inhabits Krieg. I was arrogant in my initial handling of Krieg and seriously misjudged the power and scale of the threat we are faced with. Fortunately, Krieg's own arrogance has likewise led him to misjudge the resourcefulness of his prisoner. He has invited me to ascend beyond humanity by pledging myself to his cause, or to join his inventory of embalmed corpses. I've been left to contemplate this decision, but this cell, even magically warded, cannot hold the likes of me, and I have no intention of being there when Krieg returns for my answer. Warden Krieg is found at the end of his laboratory, but he doesn't have much to say himself to you other than... Ah. I've been expecting and some other cheesy one-liners. Upon killing Krieg, you do find some new and interesting information in a note that he drops titled Missive to Warden Krieg. Warden Krieg, excuse this crude form of communication. I am far to the north, and it seems my thoughts are unable to reach you. In all future material correspondence, we will use our host names in common human language forms. I write looking for clarification of recent perplexing reports of your conduct. Is it true that you have been incarcerating and tormenting humans? What is your purpose of this? It would seem that your host's predilections are affecting your own behavior. You must bring this under your control and seize this superfluous activity. Your role is to facilitate our laboratories with the collection of corpses. Limit yourself to your parameters of this task or you will be recalled. We can assume that this letter has been written by somebody much higher up on the ethereal ladder of command, and we can also assume that far to the north is referring to Malmuth, where the ethereals housed a lot of their high ranking members before and during the Grim Dawn. The ethereal possessing Krieg hasn't been following orders, and has been much more cruel than he has needed to be to his subjects. This gives us some interesting insight about the internal politics of the ethereals, with Krieg's possessor even being threatened to be recalled from his mission. So that's the story of Warden Krieg and the Devil's Crossing, and how it was used as one of the first places in control by the Ethereals to begin their takeover on the world. This is the first lore video I've done for Grim Dawn, and I plan on doing many more, even considering making it a weekly scheduled thing. Let me know how you like the video, what criticism you have, or any suggestions of topics to tackle since there are a whole lot of really cool lore points to go over in Grim Dawn. My plan is to make at least one for each axe location, one for each faction, and some about different gods and deities of the world. So thank you guys for watching, and I will see you next time.